All right, welcome everyone to um, our next faculty roundtable that we've been holding in this fall. Um, today we're going to be discussing uh, in particular our Waymaker Concepts and Statistics course. Um, and the general format for today will be, um, we'll do a, a brief intro to uh, each other, the uh, myself, Dave, and uh, if um, Allison's able to make it in, uh, her as well, um, so that you know who we are uh, around the table. We'd love to hear from uh, the participants as well, as long as their mics are working, or you can feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Um, after that, I'll do just a brief overview introduction to Waymaker uh, as a platform, uh, and then um, a little bit more close in on uh, our statistics course. Um, and but very quickly, I want to switch over to, to Dave's experience because he's been teaching with it um, starting in the summer and he's been next generation has been this fall and we can hear uh, how he's been working with it, uh, changes he's been able to make and how he's been able to customize it for his own teaching. Um, and after that, we want to uh, maybe query Dave uh, a little bit uh, with some particular questions about his experience, but then I really want to um, leave as much time as possible um, for the rest of you. Uh, to ask your questions. Um, so hopefully that sounds good to everyone. Um, who we have around uh, the table today, I'll start with myself. I'm Jamison Miller. Uh, I'm a Director of Teaching and Learning here at Lumen Learning. Uh, formerly, well, I guess still actually actively an OER and Open Education researcher. Um, been working on some studies in Virginia, which is where I'm based as well as some uh, with the global community as well. Um, I started with Lumen uh, just this past summer, um, so still getting my, my bearings around, uh, but passionate about open education. Next, let's hear from you, Dave. And um, I'm Dave Yusinski, and I teach at Erie Community College, which is located um, in Erie County, New York, which is where Buffalo is. I actually teach at the downtown campus in Buffalo, New York. Um, I've been using OER materials probably now five years, this is probably my fifth year of using them for my courses. So I've had um, good success and would like to share that success. Great, thanks. Um, seems like there's uh, just a few people around uh, the table. Um, I'd love to hear who else is with us. Um, I'll just start at the top of the, the list. Uh, Bill, would you be willing to jump in and introduce yourself? I'm not hearing you, Bill. If you are trying to talk, maybe your mic isn't enabled. Um, that's OK. Um, looks like we're getting some typed in. Good. Deborah? And Northern Virginia, great. The other end of the state for me. I'm down in the southeast. Welcome. Ah, and you're using OER. Good, good to see. Let's see who else can type in. Jennifer from SUNY, great. Great. Thank you, Bill. All right, we'll let those continue to come in. Um, I'm hearing uh, from uh, Slack here that Allison's having trouble connecting today, but um, hopefully she'll be able to join us in a bit. She's our product manager for um, our quantitative courses, so um, she's uh, someone who knows uh, the technical uh, background to the, the course as well as uh, its design and implementation, so hopefully she'll be able to make it in for our Q&A section later. So for those of you who don't know uh, about Waymaker, uh, let me give you just kind of a, a very kind of bird's eye level view of, of what it is. Um, so at Lumen, all of our courseware is based around OER, right? So that's based on the idea that students should have day one access uh, to the content and that the content is all openly licensed so that it can be used in a variety of ways. It can be customized and changed as um, the students and the instructors see fit. Um, but what we've done with Waymaker is we've used OER as our basis to then experiment with a platform for personalized learning. And the platform comes out of a, a grant that we got from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation where we wanted to do some experimentation in designing what's called next generation courseware. Um, so 
doing something that's highly interactive, but also is really supporting um, student faculty connections. Uh, we really want to foster those connections because we know that leads to student success. Um, uh, as students work through materials, they also get feedback about where to concentrate their efforts and uh, you get frequent opportunities to actually practice the material so that you're not just supposed to be you know, soaking it in or sucking in your mind, but actually using it and implementing it. Um, all of this we try and do with seamless integration into the institutional LMS. Um, Dave and I are going to show you things in Blackboard today, but of course we can also work with Canvas, D2L, Moodle, all the other big ones. Um, and the idea there too is again just to ease and facilitate student access to the material so there's not an additional login, there's not another place to go, it's all right um, with their, their simple login at the institution. That also helps us integrate it with the gradebook, um, hopefully making any kind of grading or reporting of grades that you as the instructor have to do somewhat easier. Now our initial research on the efficacy of this platform is really promising. Um, this is based on a study we did from data we collected out of Cerritos College in the West, um, but Dave is actually going to show us a, a close-in view of some of uh, the results out of his courses, um, which are also very promising. Um, but what we see here in the slide is that um, the biggest impact that we're getting out of the gate uh, that we're seeing with a non-OER, non-Waymaker course versus the Waymaker course is a substantial reduction in drops. Um, we credit a lot of this to um, the fact that it's OER, so that the students are having access right out of the gate to the, the materials. So often that drop will happen when you know they're waiting for their financial aid to come through, or they're waiting for the shipment to take place, and they start to get behind early on in the course. Um, giving access uh, right from the beginning seems to help a lot, um, but I think also this very uh, supportive, clean, easy to see uh, interface uh, in Waymaker is, is helping there as well. So after the drop period, who ends up withdrawing? That seems to maintain about consistently. And then ultimately the students that stick around uh, are scoring the same, about the same percentage are scoring uh, a C or better. And why we see such a, a bump here in the throughput is that, and that's a conceiving of students all the way through these all of these parameters is that so many more students are sticking around that means so many more students are uh, getting that C or better and uh, we're just really happy to see these results coming in as they are. So now I want to kind of switch out of the, the slideshow and take a quick look at what Waymaker uh, concepts and statistics will look like um, if you choose to adopt it how it will come in uh, for you. Um, right into your LMS. So I'll switch over to our demo course here. So this is our uh, the course sites uh, from Blackboard. So uh, it gives you a basic feel of what it'll look like in Blackboard. Um, what Dave will show you will be from within Erie Community College's LMS, so it'll look slightly different. But when we first import the, the course for you, it'll, it'll come in as a series of folders just like this. And we have two folders here that are full of resources and how-to guides to get you oriented on, on how to set up the course and what Waymaker is. So there's lots of good, good things to get into here. Um, we've got a general welcome message. Um, some of the handiest things here are how to organize the, the course, um, tools um, we have about uh, accessibility and managing quizzes, um, as well as a how-to on setting up the messaging tools inside. So these will give you um, a way to get started. We come back in the faculty resources section. We have quite a few things to get you started here as well. We have um, this great overview of the course and how it's organized um, and what's in place, uh, listing by module um, what the learning outcomes uh, are for each of the sections. So you can see how this might align with your current teaching. Uh, to get a view of how you might want to do some reorganization. Another handy thing is that we have a, a sample syllabus in place that's based off of the course as it is, um, that you could download as a Word document so that you can copy and paste sections of it that are useful, um, bring in uh, as you like to, to amend your own syllabus. Um, all the quiz banks, assignments, PowerPoints are here, and uh, with all of our uh, 
main courses, we, we also have a kind of a polished PDF um, that you can download, uh, load into the, the course, or just give students the link to so they can download on their own. And, and that way, uh, should they want to print it out or just have a copy that they can download to their devices, um, that'll be available to them as well. That of course they can keep in, in perpetuity. Uh, the one I want to take a closer look at here is the Waymaker Faculty Tools. This this link here uh, would be basically your go-to. It's kind of your dashboard into uh, what's happening in your course. Um, right now, um, um, as this is a sample course, we don't have any students in here, but if I load, oops, sorry. Um, what we can do here is set up uh, the communication tool. Um, and then one of the key parts to, to Waymaker is the fostering the student-faculty uh, connection. So what we've done to facilitate that is we've set up uh, some automated and semi-automated messaging tools that will be triggered um, either when a student does really well on a quiz, uh, just to say, hey, great job, well done. Um, the kind of messages maybe that we had always intended to send to students, but rarely find the time, especially with successful students. Um, but it will also uh, trigger messages for students who have like a large disconnect where they, they seem to be participating in the course along the way. Waymaker sees that they're participating and, and doing the the different practice sessions along the way, but are still scoring low in their quizzes, and can shoot them some automated messaging, giving them some suggestions of where they might want to study and, and look into. Um, additionally, there's a, an opportunity, uh, it'll flag students who seem to be troubled, um, and it'll give you the chance to send them a message and do some additional customization to that message before you zip it off to them. So with all those, um, there's just this five-step, step-by-step, need to set up once at the beginning of the semester and it kind of puts it in place for you uh, and helps you talk uh, with your students, communicate with your students uh, throughout the, the semester. Um, and I'll let Dave talk a little bit about how he's been using that and maybe how students have been responding to it. Um, I don't want to spend too much time there today. Um, also, I want to show, and Dave's going to show some of this as well, but just to give you a basic uh, insight into how the course is structured. So each of these folders is basically kind of like a chapter um, to uh, a textbook. And within each of these, if we go on in, you'll see that there's a study plan. And this is where the core of the content is in Waymaker. And again, this all uh, arrives to the students right here inside their LMS. So for them, they don't notice that they're having to do any logging in or going to a separate place. Um, and with each chapter, it's organized into these three sections. I want to just minimize so you can see them. We have a get started section, like an introduction to what's going on, a dive in, which is where the core of the content is, and then at the end we have what we call finish strong, which is where we have a, a quiz, uh, a summative assessment uh, for each one of the, the tiles, or each one of the sections. In get started, we have why it matters, you know, we talk about, you know, let's orient this course within the larger, larger context. Um, and then we have a pretest. And this pretest is pretty great because what it does is based on student responses, um, it'll direct students, um, it'll change the tiles in the dive in section. So see how this has some orange and some blue tracks here? These change color and uh, label based on how students have done in the pretest. So in the student that conducted the pretest here, it says, hey, you know, you've actually got a pretty good idea about conducting experiments, but you're going to need to spend some time. Um, these might be a little bit newer to you, just the types of statistical studies and uh, how sampling works, how effective sampling works. So this is where the personalization starts to take place. Um, down at the bottom, when we come to the, the finishing strong, um, we have a a review section, the putting it all together, and then there's a quiz. And we default to setting two quiz attempts because this is based around the mastery learning kind of attempt. So we want to encourage students to try it and get some feedback. So Waymaker generates some feedback. It gives you, the instructor, opportunity to give deeper, more pointed feedback. Um, you'll also get to see how students are doing on their quiz attempts. Um, we have some faculty um, that I've talked with that are teaching in Waymaker and business and they actually have students complete their first go at the quiz ahead of coming into a class meeting. Um, and at the class meeting, she's able to look at all of their responses, 
give some feedback to the student at large, and then they take the second quiz attempt right there in class. Um, so it gives them a chance to interact with it that way. There's lots of ways to incorporate it into your face-to-face -face teaching, even if you aren't doing it online. So those are some of the basics that I wanted to touch on in Waymaker. The, all the faculty resources that are available to you in there. The fact that you'll have this opportunity to customize some messaging tools. And then the layout of those study plans. Um, so from here, I'd like to take a closer look into how you've been teaching it, Dave. So I want to hand it over to you. Um, so I'll stop sharing my screen. All right. So I wanted to begin with some data that I've collected over the years using OER. Um, I, I wanted to ensure that using OER materials actually has helped my students having access from day one. So I've been keeping a running, running total of how students have performed in my courses. So this is my introductory stats course. And in my introductory stats course, you can see that with the paid textbook, I had a sample size of 380 students. And with the open source, I have 299. So you can see that it's about equal at this moment. My first five years of teaching, I had been using a, a paid textbook in an online homework environment that the students had to purchase. And uh, so within the last five years, I've converted over to uh, this concept and statistics course. So you can see that my success rates have gone up by about 13%, which is pretty amazing to actually have 80% of the students. Now, I do have to, uh, in all fairness, say that this does include uh, D grades. It's not just C and higher. Okay. Um, but there aren't that many D grades, because most of the students who take this class at our community college will need to transfer, so they need to get a C or higher in the class. So of this percentage of students in the D range, it's very few. Um, it might be 2% at most. All right, and just for the sake of showing that I am using OER in my other course, I have Calculus and Analytic Geometry, which I'm using through OHM, uh, which is the online homework manager through Lumen Learning. Um, it was originally my open math. And I've been using this for several semesters. And you can see, based on the paid textbook, which was quite pricey, um, students have actually performed quite a bit better in, in my uh, calculus course. And just to show how much money my students have saved over the last few years, uh, this is how many students have taken my courses, uh, um, both um, the statistics and the calculus course. And so I have a range of values. A low value would be about $62,000. Um, and the high mark is about 114000 So somewhere in between is probably where the true cost of savings is um, for these students. All right, so let me get out of that. So the next step, what I wanted to do uh, was to show you know, what it looks like for my students when they enter my course in Blackboard so that you can see how it is seamlessly integrated. Um, so I have on my front page our announcements and things that are due. So upcoming this next Sunday, I have to update this announcement, talk about my next few assignments that are due. But what I have then is that it's organized by week. So I go over here to contents. And within my class, then I have weeks. And I try to have this paced out as, as to where students uh, should be as they go through the course. So now what I want to do is take you through some of the activities um, and the reading that's involved. So while I do, I wanted to share a story about this. A colleague of mine was retiring, or had planned to retire in three semesters. And we had been teaching statistics together at this campus. And what happened was, during the summer, uh, about five years ago, four or five years ago, uh, I had started investigating this concepts and statistics course. And as I was looking through the materials, I realized that, if, and I'll click on some of the materials here to see what you're reading. Um, as I was reading through the materials, I recognized that this was far better than the textbook that I have been using. There we go. And let me go here to the first page. So I had. Um, sent an email to my colleague, and this was like during June, uh, when you do most of our course development. And I sent an email to her, and I said, um, by the way, I said, you might want to take a look at this, you know, these course materials. I found that they are far better than the textbook we're using. Um, you might want to consider adopting this. To which she replied instantly, I'm retiring in three months, or three semesters. I don't want to rework my whole course. Um, I'll be out of here in three semesters. Two weeks later, I get a second email. 
And she said, if I don't use these materials, I will be doing a disservice to my students who will not be able to live with myself. So we spent the summer actually creating and adapting these materials to our uh, course outline and our institution outline. But if you take a look at what the students see as they read through the material, so my assignments are both reading and doing um, quizzes uh, interactively on, on Blackboard. So they, when they read, it's not just stagnant reading. They have an example. They talk about what's happening. They give some ideas here um, about bias. In this case, it was bias and sampling. So they're expecting students in the following window uh, to do some samples of five. And as you click on these interactive, this interactive activity, uh, it's saying keep track of how much uh, each, what your average, your mean diameter was. So if you just randomly, supposedly randomly, pick <coughs> five um, circles here, then you can record that number. And then you do reset. And you, you probably know what's going to happen. These circles are biased by the area of which they take up. And therefore, students will typically grab larger circles. And you would record those numbers. And then down below it says, record those average uh, the, the average diameter for the 10 samples you chose. So if a student then puts in their answers, let's say you got 20, 35, et cetera, um, you could check your answer and see what their option is. Obviously, in this case, because they're doing sampling, answers will vary. But then the next part of the question is where things get interesting. It says the average diameter for these 60 circles is actually 19.3. They already suspect that you are actually going to pick the larger circles. So they're asking for the, how many of the samples had, a larger, had an average diameter greater and how many had an average diameter less. And then you can type your response here, several had diameters, dot, 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 that were greater than, and then you check what their response would be. So not only are they reading the textbook or reading the online material, they're interacting it as well. And then you continue on with this experiment, and now you can actually have the computer generate random samples. And you do this, and you keep clicking, and then you record those results, and that's when you do, you're creating a sampling distribution um, based on this. So once the students have progressed through this page and answered some questions going through here, and some are multiple choice, I do also like the feedback and the multiple choice questions. Um, if you click the wrong one, let me see here. Let's do sampling variability. It'll tell you why your answer is incorrect. And then you can try, it'll show you which one's the correct one. But it actually helps you try to identify what misconceptions you may have had in answering the wrong multiple choice. So as you finish up to the next page, down at the bottom there is a link or a little button to make to move them on to the next part of this uh, chapter. And then finally, at the end, it asks them these questions, which I find pretty fascinating because they ask them a question, but then they're also asked, how sure are you in your response? Is it just a guess? Pretty sure, very sure. And that leads to some good discussions in class. You know, they might just be just a guess, or obviously what we would not like to see is a student answer a question incorrectly and be very sure about it. That would not be good. So, but this actually tries to help address how well students have learned the concepts in, those, in, in that section. All right, so after they're done, there's a quiz that they can take. And you can view the quiz with this gear here, which allows you to actually edit the quiz and remove any questions uh, or even add that are not quite in there. So if I edit the quiz, oh boy. <laughs> Jameson, just our luck. Oh, yes. Let's try that again. Yeah, try again. All right, so what I can yeah. do is actually go into the quiz um, and look at the answer key. I'm going to go in a different way. This I'm not allowed to edit questions via this route, but I can at least see all the questions that could be randomly generated that would populate this quiz as students take it. And on the right-hand side would be the learning outcome that's associated with each question. So the students will actually take two versions of this quiz. And one of the things I try to emphasize for students is after you're done with the first attempt, please don't just take the second attempt. Try to learn from your mistakes. Go back and study so that you can improve your results the second time you take it. And so what do I see after students are actually done taking the quiz and I can 
dig into the results. Now I have my screen kind of moved over to the side here so I can protect student names from this semester. Uh, but I can see what scores they have and they, what they received on this quiz. So this person at the top here actually only attempted once and earned a score of a 70. Not, I guess they're satisfied with a C minus. Um, so they did not continue to take the multiple attempts. This person actually scored 70 on both, so the questions that were regenerated, still they quite didn't get the concept, so they still scored about the same. This person improved slightly. Um, if I feel like a student has taken a quiz or there was an errant attempt where they had submit too soon, I am actually allowed to, to grant more attempts over here uh, so that I could manage um, their attempts. You can see this person over here uh, had an issue where somehow they had a disconnect from the quiz. I don't know if they were on their mobile device. That seems to be sometimes an issue if they're on their mobile device and they lose connectivity. Uh, you get the score of none. So I can see they really only took the quiz once, so I had granted one, one more attempt so that uh, they could take it again. All right. Last but not least, I wanted to show some other things that I use for assessment purposes in this course. So some of the things that are embedded in Blackboard is you uh, import this Waymaker course are things called assignments. So some of the assignments are fairly interactive. Um, I have students actually upload screenshots of what they've done and answer the questions so that um, I can grade this right within Blackboard. So for example, with this one, they're, they're uh, testing sample means and confidence intervals. And we can do a single sample and continue to hit them, or just do the sample of 50. And then, OK, so it added the 53. So let's do that again. Let's do 50, and they said 47 hints. So 94% of the samples captured the true population mean. Hmm. So the students can say, well, mine came in a little under. What happens if I do it again? Or what if I reset and do it again? Oh boy, 94 again, let's see. There we go, so now we have 96. So approximately 95% of the confidence intervals will actually capture the true population mean. Other types of assignments then that the students can do or what's involved with some of the assignments is that they actually have data that they will work with. And what's clever about the way Waymaker puts this course together is that it's basically technology independent. You can pick the technology that you're using. here. At in uh, New York State and SUNY, uh, we have a contract with Minitab, so all students have um, access to Minitab. So we would click on the Minitab instructions, and the data is, well, I'm really zoomed in there. Um, the data would be downloaded here for Minitab, and then here are the step-by-step -step, um, directions on how they can actually obtain the results. So just to take a look at a couple other assignments here in 10, uh, this, by the way, was based on one of the labs, uh, which I'll talk about in my, or the last piece. Um, I'll just go back and talk about it, but it's the drinking habits of college students. And then here's another one with matched pairs. So there's actually like a, a little history lesson here in a tribute to William Gossett, who actually developed the student T distribution. Um, and the students, you know, can read about him and learn about how he actually used this uh, in, in uh, I guess, uh, analyzing his his output from regular seed and kiln-dried seeds. Um, and this data, again, is available if you click on the mini tab. So it's already typed in. So the last thing I want to talk about is one last piece that's interactive within the reading. It's something called Stat Tutor Labs. And we typically work through these in the classroom. And I have students work independently and, uh, or in small groups. And we'll work through them um, step by step. So let me show you what this looks like. What they have to do at the end of the Stat Tutor Lab is actually upload all of the technology steps that they did um, and a screenshot showing that they actually completed the lab. So let me take a look here at Unit 10. So in Unit 10, we'll get those tiles again. This time, there's an additional tile with the Finish Strong called Stat Tutor. And there's, in, in this course, there are six labs in, all together um, that are built in. So let me click on this and then go into the lab. All right, and the lab basically is designed to go through it linearly, step by step in the process here. So you're supposed to work at the top here, figure out what questions you're supposed to answer, what are the variables. The data can be downloaded in different formats again. So I would pick Minitab and then download the data. Um, and then over here, in this main box over here, is where you would advance to the next uh, part of the problem. 
give us examples what we should be clicking on, what we should be reading. And then this part here is actually asking us, and it's interactive and it has to be graded, um, questions about the data set. And I have no idea <laughs> what the answer is for this one. <laughs> so we could guess. OK, that's red. Uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. All right, it's more than five. So out of the first 10 students, a lot of people took care of, did the extra credit. There it is. So it would turn green. And the only way they can advance through this uh, lab is if, if they're getting these questions correctly. Now, I just did it randomly. That is frustrating. Hopefully, the students are frustrated enough that they will actually read through the data and actually try to find out how many of the first 10 um, took the extra credit. So once they're done, as they go through each page, little green check marks show up in these boxes that show progress on the lab. Um, when they're all done, I have them take a screenshot to show me that they have actually worked through the whole lab. And some of the major technology pieces or the technology requirements of the course then are copied over to a Word document so that they can submit it. And I believe that is all I had to say. <laughs> Davison, do you think I missed anything? No, I think that's all the parts we, we wanted to cover. Um, uh, what's really great to see, uh, and, and thank you, Dave, what's really great to see uh, here in your course is just how much customization uh, you were able to, to implement uh, to really kind of make this course uh, fit, you know, the objectives at Erie and, and what you guys want, um, reorganizing things, moving them around within Blackboard. Um, did you find that to be uh, pretty straightforward? Yeah. I mean, it seems like you're fairly comfortable with Blackboard. Was there any difference in, in working with our materials as traditionally you've been working Not with? Not at all. So when I first imported Waymaker, it came in as a hidden uh, folder over here, Concepts and Statistics. And what I did then is these are two topics that are optional for our elementary statistics course, so they have never put them live into the class. But all I did then was take the folders and move them over. I like having the folders numbered. OK, just, I don't know. <laughs> so I actually called them like Unit 1, Unit 2. Um, and then this were, these were the uh, folders that I left unpublished for the faculty resources. Um, one thing, Jameson, you, you didn't click on was the PowerPoints, but there are PowerPoints associated with it. I've used them for examples in class. I do not typically use PowerPoints in my classroom. I use uh, worksheets where the students are, uh, are guided notes, if you will, and they're working together. But the PowerPoints is a good place to start if you're trying to anchor some ideas from each unit. Great, right. So that's, yeah, definitely one of the, the things that Lumen is trying to do with, with all of our uh, courses is to really offer all of the resources that people have started to come to expect uh, from our teaching materials and, and educational resources. So to have all those extras in there, uh, so just to make OER adoption that much yeah, easier. Yeah, I would, if I had to put a time frame on it, it basically took me about one to two hours just so that I had the, um, uh, one to two hours just so I had all the folders in the right places and you know one of the hard things is pacing with your students you know how, how much can we actually do and, and what time frame um, but other than that it, it was relatively painless and then just and it does integrate with the the grade book I do not want to click on the grade book because you'll see student names <laughs> um, but uh, it all integrates so all those quiz attempts uh, I take the highest of the two I do not I don't average them I take the highest all those quiz attempts and all the other homework assignments um, that I have to hand grade or whatever but it's all connected to the blackboard all right so I'll okay. stop sharing here. well we just got a good question Sure, yeah. We just got a great question over here from uh, Deborah in the chat. Um, Allison uh, Day is with us. She's uh, our course product manager uh, here. Um, it would be great if you could uh, vocalize your response that you uh, put in there, Allison, and let people know about, yeah, um, we know that the Waymaker course is built on OER. Um, so where did this, uh, where did this content come from? Um, thanks, Jameson, and thanks for the question, Deborah. Um, the, the content itself um, is actually, we, we have an agreement with OLI, um, which is uh, from uh, Carnegie Mellon. They originally developed the course, and so we imported their content into our, our platform. Um, so we, we were able to add the Waymaker teacher and student tools 
um, to that content. And we also have a version, if you are really interested in writing your own um, materials and you really, really want to deeply customize, we do have a version that does not have Waymaker tools that you can um, customize very deeply. It has um, editing capabilities. So yeah, like you know that uh, um, Waymaker, um, as we've shown, uh, offers uh, some degree of customization. Have you run into the limits of the customization, or have you found it to be um, so? Useful? I when I had spoke uh, when I had previously spoken that uh, five years ago is when I adopted the course um, for our courses. It was through the OLI, and it was extremely unmanageable. <laughs> I couldn't edit anything in terms of the checkpoints. Um, I was limited to just including or not including a full section. Um, the Waymaker has improved that substantially, especially the assessment items. And it has actually improved the course because um, the OLI, some of those assignments were built into the chapters, but I could never see those results. That was that just went into the students. I didn't. I wasn't sure if they actually completed them or not. But now that they're actually listed as separate assignments in my Blackboard course, the students have to upload those materials, and I can keep a better um, well, I can at least score them and, and make sure students are actually completing those assignments. So it has improved substantially um, in terms of some of the customization that I can do. So I definitely want to open up the, uh, the floor to any of our other participants. Uh, any questions that uh, come to mind? I, I just want to quickly thank Dave. That was really, really nice to see how you um, customize the, the content to fit the needs of your class. It's really fun to see how people are doing things out in the wild. So thanks a lot for sharing all of that. Looks like we've oh, got sure. a question. Um, I see that there's another question that was <laughs> addressed to me. I also wanted to, OK, so the question says, do, do I find that the practices engage students' concept, conceptual understanding of statistical content? What I have found was that the, the book was so readable because of the the examples that seem to be real time. They take a lot of surveys from within the last 10 years, so it's relevant. Um, and moreover, one of the things in concept of statistics is rarely, and I cannot remember other than one assignment I'm thinking of, um, where they're trying to help students understand standard deviation, uh, where all the data is actually based on, on real life situations. They, they don't just generate random data sets and they find the mean and the standard deviation or the median and uh, they actually are trying to make it applicable to either Gallup surveys and um, uh, census data that, that has been imported into the class. So that is the reason I think that the students, um, and that's the, re that's the ultimate reason why students, I believe, are reading more of the material and, and engaging in the material. Um, that's, that's, basically, uh, that's basically the huge bonus of, of this of material. And, one of the things that I guess I have done differently with the course is, based on the new gaze recommendations, uh, they really want us to focus more on conceptual understanding of statistics, not just the idea of what is standard deviation, but what does it mean in terms of measure of spread. Um, and so in this class, I really focus on having students, and I they, they have to interpret the number in the context of the question which is challenging because they have to go, they can't just come up with a memorized blanket statement. We reject the null hypothesis. Well, that is meaningless. What, what do you mean by that? So they have to actually relate it back to the study that they're working on. Yeah, that's great. And that's, uh, it's worth noting, too, that we have current uh, examples of um, data uh, from the real world, but that that also uh, can and, and will be updated uh, into the future. Another benefit of this being uh, digital and also being uh, openly licensed is that we can grab um, new data and update things quite quite quickly and readily um, to keep up with the times so it doesn't start to age uh, too dramatically with time. So Dave, you've been uh, working with us at Lumen for a while, so you must uh, I think I would know what the answer to this question would be, but how has uh, working with uh, Lumen been compared to working with uh, other uh, providers or publishers uh, in the past? Um, it's, and I'm not just saying this, <laughs> but it's been great. Um, one of the things the OLI had done uh, a couple of years ago was they changed the format of the Stat Tutor Labs, and 
it was painful because they changed the format and the, the coding never let them finish the lab when they were moving on to the next question. There were hiccups in the, in the coding. So I had emailed the tech support at um, Carnegie or at the OLI to help with this. And it took a full semester before they actually were able to fix some of these glitches. So that was unfortunate. Um, my experiences with, with Lumen have been remarkable. Uh, I had initially planned on piloting the concept in stats course in summer two. Our summer two starts July 3rd. So we had this big plan of um, moving my summer course over to uh, my online summer course uh, uh, to this platform. Um, as I went to create my class in the OLI in, in May, early May, uh, there was now a fee that was being charged where previously it was covered under a grant. So I had, had to ask Lumen to actually move up the start date. And I know they, they did a lot of work to do that. And I only gave them two weeks notice to move it up to May 17th or whatever the, the beginning of summer one was. Um, so they've been extremely helpful. Furthermore, um, because as with any book adoption, first editions or whatever, even coming out of the OLI, they, they were basically just taking the text from the OLI and there were plenty of errata built in. I used to, in summer one and summer two, I gave my students bonus points for any mistakes that they found. <laughs> and mm -hmm. lo and behold, Ross and other people at Lumen fixed those mistakes within, by, by summer two, the, the mistakes had been fixed, and then the summer two mistakes are, have been fixed um, for the fall. So now the book, students aren't finding mistakes anymore. <laughs> so they, they've been, they, they're working at creating a, a polished uh, textbook um, or online materials um, error-free. And, and the, the feedback and, and the quickness at which that's done is, is awesome. Excellent. So uh, yeah, I, I've been impressed with um, my brief tenure so far at Lumen as well. I mean, it goes to show you know that we've got someone like Allison Day joining us today. We've got people from you know doing the coding and development work uh, to the support staff that are involved, and uh, uh, we're all trying to get a good picture of the entire experience and actually yeah make make things happen for people and can be really responsive that way. Um, another, the, the last question I have for you, Dave, is if you could speak to uh, the messaging tools or any other aspect oh, of right. the student experience, if you're getting, what you're getting back from students in terms of what they think of the, the Waymaker platform. So one of the features of the platform is that when they do take the quizzes or are working in the formative assessment, those end of uh, section quizzes that they're taking, uh, they can be notified if they're not doing well. So if they fall below a certain benchmark score, which I've set to be 75%, an automatic message, which I've basically edited, adapted to some of the wording I would like, um, will automatically be emailed to those students. Um, some things like, for example, with the quizzes, uh, please make sure you, you go back and study the materials before, before attempting your second attempt. And here are some resources that you might want to consider um, to look at. Uh, so those communication tools, I, I believe, are little pushes in the right direction. Um, the feedback from the students, uh, and, and in one of those uh, messages as well, it says, please come, you know, if you're still having problems understanding this concept, please contact me or stop by my office. Uh, and some of the students haven't replied to the messages necessarily, um, and they haven't been, uh, they haven't replied in a way that also, they haven't said they were annoying by any stretch. I think they're just like gentle reminders on what they could do to improve, um, that they're getting these little email notices automatically. Um, so I, I do think they're working, and I don't think it's overburdensome, and I don't think it's annoying because I'm not receiving the feedback saying, please stop sending me these emails. Um, the students are actually trying to improve their grades and trying to improve how they're attacking those quizzes. Yeah, really great to hear. Well, unless we have any other uh, burning questions from the round table, um, I think we can uh, let you on with your day, uh, Dave. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, yeah, I'll echo what Allison said. It is so much fun to see, uh, at least get a, a peek into how someone's actually teaching this, uh, to, to see it in the wild um, and to see where, where you can take it. Um, this has been really, really helpful. Um, I hope the group has found it helpful, and I think this uh, this recording will be a, a valuable a valuable resource uh, for others going forward. Um,
I want to remind everyone uh, that we have quite a few resources available. Um, you can visit our website to review other courses um, that, that we have, not just statistics. Um, so for your colleagues that, that might be interested in adopting OER, um, those are available. Um, we can give you access, them access, to the faculty resources associated with each of the courses so you can see what the assessments look like, the activities, the PowerPoints, these kinds of things. Um, if you know anyone who uh, is composition faculty uh, at your school and has some time tomorrow evening, Eastern time, four to five, we're having uh, the last of our roundtable sessions then. Um, that one we might have three faculty uh, guiding us through uh, a project that's been going on at uh, University of Mississippi. Um, and for any follow-up, please don't hesitate to contact myself. Um, Allison has uh, put her email in the chat, and uh, Dave is also making himself available. Um, uh, for any questions, we'd be happy uh, to either give you access or um, um, answer any questions, maybe offer further demos if, if that would be of help. So thanks for your time, and thanks again, Dave. Take care.